Welcome back. So this lecture is going to start diving into some aspects of historical linguistics from a broader point of view, but thinking about some of our Germanic roots and some of the relationships to English as well. So when we're thinking about historical linguistics as a general field, historical linguistics just studies language change over time. And this is one of our older forms of linguistic study. Um, this came about partly because in the early 1800s, Jacob Grimm of the Grimm brothers um, realized that ancient Greek, ancient Latin, and ancient Sanskrit had, Sanskrit had some similarities between each other. And so what he started looking at and what he started positing was that, well, if Latin later became Spanish and French, maybe there was some earlier language that became Greek and Latin and Sanskrit, and they could find similarities and sort of think about what would have been like that before. And it turns out he was pretty spot on. So each of these turned out to be various branches of what we now call Indo-European languages, and he was getting into the beginnings of determining what that Indo-European language prior to these branches would have looked like. So one question that ends up being very important when we're thinking about these historical linguistic aspects is how far back we can go for what we can determine and what we can sort of reconstruct. <clears throat> and this depends largely on what kind of documentation we have, if we have any. So many languages don't have any writing at all, um, or just are not written languages, so we can't go back as far. English does have some writings. We have some that are going back about 1,500 years or so, but the earliest reliable writings that we have in English are from about the 7th century. Um, so we have some from around the middle part of the Old English period as the earliest ones that we can really focus on. We don't have a lot of remaining documentation from the very beginnings of the Old English time period. And so some of these languages might even pr provide us with longer records, languages like Latin, which go into the times before the Common Era, um, but a lot of languages don't provide us with this historical record. So without a written record, we can typically reconstruct earlier languages based on what's currently spoken today to about one or 2,000 years ago. But when we have a written record, things like Latin, Greek, Sanskrit that go back several thousand years, we can actually approximate Proto-Indo-European to about 5,000 years ago. And as we dive further into the linguistic aspects of this in some of the future lectures, we'll be able to see some of those forms um, and be able to posit some of those forms as well. So one way that we're trying to figure out, well, how are these languages related? What would have been the previous language that they branched off of? We have some steps that we use to determine how things might be what we would call genetically related. So similar to how biological relatedness happens, where you have taxonomies that sort of say, this is what the sort of general family is, and then there are these different branches that branch off with more specifics. We think of languages as having a sort of family tree, a sort of language family, in the same kind of general way. And we have a couple of ways to determine this, and it can be much more complicated than just these, but these are the most common tools that we'll have. And these ones are typically looking first for cognates and cognate sets to find if there appears to be some similarities between languages, and then using what's known as the comparative method to try to figure out, well, what would have the language prior to these languages actually looked like? So the first step is to start by finding cognate sets. And cognates or cognate sets are words that have historical relationships with each other in different languages. So this helps us to determine relationships between languages and establish these language families. And so what we are looking for specifically is that cognates share phonetic material, but they also share semantic meaning. So there's two pieces that are in extremely important, um, that you need to have something that looks similar phonetically or sounds similar phonetically, but that they also share a semantic meaning. So the English word cat and the Spanish word gato, which means cat, would be cognates with each other. And the way we can tell this is that even though they're not the exact same sounds, they have similar sounds to each other. So the first sound, these are both velar plosives. One is voiced, one's voiceless. The vowel that's there is both, they're both low vowels. One's just a little further front than the other. And then the T is exactly identical with uh, both languages. That O is a separate morpheme, so that wouldn't really play into our analysis for this particular word. But we have similarities and we can find other similarities that looks that look about the same, the changes that look about the same, and come up with a set of these words that can show this kind of relationship. However, there are times that we can also find what are known as false cognates that look like they might be related, but actually aren't. They don't have a historical relationship to each other. They just happen to sound similar. So this is why you need both of those pieces, both the phonetic material and the semantic meaning, because a word like embarrassed in English sounds very close to embarazada in Spanish, but embarazada means pregnant, 
And these don't have a historical relationship to each other. They just happen to sound similar to each other. So these are what we would call false cognates because they're not actually giving us information about the relatedness between languages. So once we find cognate sets, we can then use what's known as the comparative method in order to check how languages might be related, figure out what the languages might have looked like prior. So the first step is to find those cognate sets and then to start comparing those words that have similar meaning to try to find what those phonetic similarities are and what the most likely scenario would have been for what that previous language form would be. And one of the most common ways to do this is to use something that's known as a Swadesh list. And the Swadesh list is something that you don't, um, <clears throat> so I'll show this to you. You don't need to write this down. This is just an example. These are words that are typically seen as common to any human experience, regardless of language, regardless of culture, or regardless of where a language might have been originally spoken. Um, and so these are things like very basic numbers, um, things like body parts and very common activities that humans would do. So sitting, standing, um, things, things that you might find in the world around you, some basic color terms, um, some nature terms that you might find, regardless of where you might actually be physically. And so this one is the list of 100. Sometimes they also have a 200 word list that they use. And this is often a starting point that is used to determine if languages have cognates with each other or not, because these tend to be some of the most common words. And because they're common, they're expected to not really have been borrowed very frequently. They're unlikely to change as quickly because they're used so frequently in languages. So these are seen as a good list in, to, as a sort of starting point to find cognates. And then you can kind of expand from there and look at other words and look at other examples beyond these. But we'll use these as a sort of starting point as we're thinking about what are likely to be found um, as different cognates between languages. So we'll start by looking at an example. So I'll give you an example of several different languages. These are six different languages. And if you take a moment, you can pause the video if you'd like. You can um, follow through if you want. And just take a moment and look and try to determine if you can see any similarities between some of these languages. If any of them are related to each other very obviously or maybe slightly less obviously but with some similarities to each other. Um, and so you can take a moment and think about that. <clears throat> and as we try to go through and look for if these languages are actually related to each other, the answer for this entire set is that, well, in some ways, yes, they are. And in some ways, no, they're not. So all of these languages belong to the Indo-European family. You also saw English as one of those. But that chart represents several different branches or subfamilies of the family tree for Indo-European that are represented. So what we can do is we can look for what are those similarities, what are those patterns that we can find to start beginning to find relationships and reconstruct an earlier form. And so we may be doing it just based on an individual subbranch. So we might just find a Germanic word and then have to compare some of those other older words to get to Proto-Indo-European. There can be multiple steps, especially with a complicated family tree like Indo-European. But once we can start establishing those cognate sets, we can then start working backwards, looking through the similarities that they have to each other. And if something's not quite as obvious, we can also use probable changes, probable phonological changes that would explain why a sound would change in one way versus a different direction. So if we go back to that chart and say, okay, well, how are these more, more closely related? If we look at the actual languages themselves, what we have here is Swedish, Icelandic, and Icelandic English, Spanish, French, and Lithuanian. So these are all Indo-European languages, but there's several different branches of Indo-European represented here. So we have the first three that are Germanic languages, we have the next two that are Romance languages, and then Lithuanian would be a Baltic language. So Lithuanian looks a lot different than these others, and that would make sense because it's in a different branch, it's in a different subfamily than these other languages. So if we start looking at them individually by different groups and by different subfamilies, you may notice we focus first on the Germanic ones, that there's a lot of crossover. The ones that you see in green are things where you see crossover in sounds that are either similar or identical between different languages. So zwart, zwartur, black. English has a different word for black, partly because we ended up getting that from the word that Romance languages got for white, so blanc and black, um, which originally in Indo-European meant fire. And so we took the sort of soot, smoke aspect of that word to get black, and they took the sort of light, fiery kind of word to get white. But you see a lot of other similarities as well. Hrod, red, 
and ain one. So there's some similarities, some differences, but you see a lot of crossover between all of these. If we look at the Romance languages, you also notice a lot of similarities between them as well, where the roots themselves, so if you take that O off of the Spanish, the roots are almost both very, very similar to each other. Negro, noir, blanc, blanc, rojo, rouge, un, un, dos, du, mano, main. So we have a lot of similarities, a lot of sounds that are either the same or similar that we could probably look at many other words and come up with a pattern, come up with a phonological rule that might explain how one language has changed in one way and another language has changed in a different way. And then we have the Baltic one. And since we only have one here, we don't really have a way to compare that with others in its subfamily. But we can start looking at them across these different subfamilies. And you'll notice there's a lot of crossover between these subfamilies as well. So some of them seem to be more specific to Germanic, some things like Zwart and, um, that you see in Swedish and Icelandic, but then you have words like Black and Blank and Blank and Balta that have similarities, some similar sounds, and you have in the words for Red 1 and 2, you'll notice that there's a lot of similarities across all six of these languages. So the R and the A ah sound or the E eh sound seems to go all the way through for the color red. The number one seems to go through with Germanic and Romance, but not with the Baltic one. But the number for two, du, do, dos, tu, dvo, dva, we see a lot of similarities. And so in Germanic, we seem to see a T sound at the beginning of that word, whereas in Spanish, French, Lithuanian, there's a D sound. But these are both very similar sounds to each other. And so we can see some crossover between these families as well, as opposed to just looking within the individual subfamilies. So as we try to compare these, we can start comparing them, look for similarities, and try to figure out, well, what would that earlier form have looked like if we're comparing words that are in different subfamilies of Indo-European? So the example that I'll give you here is the word for father in several different sounds, um, several different languages that are found across Indo-European subfamilies. And what I'd like you to do is focus on the consonants, because in this particular example, the vowels had done some other unique changes that won't be easily visible through this analysis. But the way that you're going to go through and look at these is that you'll try to find, well, what are the ones that, are there any pieces that are exactly identical in all of the words? We don't seem to have anything that's exactly identical. So then we want to look at what we would call majority rules. So for each sound in the word, we want to figure out, well, what is the most common, what is the most likely sound to have continued to be passed down from that previous form, whereas some of the changes might indicate that those languages have changed while others haven't. So if we start with the first sound, these are all labial sounds, and we have an F in English, we have a V in German, and we have a P in all of the other ones. So if we just list those out for that spot, that first sound in the word, we have F, V, P, 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 and P. So if we think about majority rules, we'll probably expect to have a P. That's, that would be what we would posit there. So you can sort of write down or think about a P that would be there. We have a coronal sound as the next consonant in each of these examples. So in English, we have an inner dental sound, so our th sound. In German, there's a D. In Spanish, there's a D. And then in Greek and Hindi and Persian, we have a T sound, a T. And so again, looking through, we have a majority. So even though it's not quite as strong of a majority, there are three of them that are T, and then a few others that have changed as well. So based on this, we'll still posit that T is the most likely thing to have changed. Part of this is also because T as a sound is a voiceless sound, and we're seeing this between vowels and between voiced sounds, and it's much more common for a sound change to eventually move to where a voiceless sound would become voiced in between vowels rather than the other way around. So just thinking about the common linguistic patterns would also give us T as the one that would be most likely to have been in the reconstructed, the earlier form. So we would pick T for that one. And then at the end of the words, we have a lot of these rhotic sounds in most languages. So in English, we have an er sound. In many of them, we have the trill r sound. And then in Hindi, there's just no sound there at all. But looking through there, our r sound, the upright r, the trill r, would be the one that we would probably go with because that is, again, the most common. So once we put those together, we would have p, t, and r. And then with the vowels, how they were, the actual reconstructed form, ter, 
is due to other changes because of those vowels. So there's some different changes that have happened with the vowels, which is why we were focusing just on the consonants. But based on that majority of rules, we were able to figure out which consonants were most likely to have been there. And then we can corroborate that looking at other examples, other words as well if we need to. So when we're thinking about these, we're looking for these kinds of common and regular correspondences that we see between these different languages. So we saw a lot of closely related languages in the word for father because the ones that were more closely related tend to pattern more similarly. So in the first consonant, our Germanic words, our Germanic languages, English and German, were using fricatives that were still labial, but they were using fricative sounds instead, whereas the other language branches were using a plosive P. And then in the second consonant, there were some other crossovers as well, where English has a voiceless fricative, German and Spanish were using a voiced plosive, and then all of the other branches were using voiceless plosives. So we're still seeing similarities across these different sub, um, subfamilies. And then the third consonant were all rhotic except for Hindi, which just didn't have a final consonant at, at all. So we're seeing a lot of similarities, and that's how we can kind of, with multiple examples, start piecing together how similar languages are to each other. So this would imply that it's likely that English and German are much more closely related to each other, but that Germanic languages and Romance languages may also be a little bit more closely related to each other than some of the other languages that we saw in the examples. And so looking through these kinds of correspondences, we can see some differences, but we can also see some similarities. So if we go back to Germanic and Romance languages, we'll notice that there are some things that tend to happen very similarly that we can start looking at other examples, other words, and start finding an overarching kind of change that may have taken place. So in English and German and Swedish, the word for foot all has a f at the beginning, whereas in the Romance languages, there's a p sound. In English, German, and Swedish, there's a t or a z sound. The z letter in German makes a z sound, whereas there's a d sound in French, Italian, and Spanish. So what we're noticing is that there's similarities between those sounds, but that they're consistent within their family, but related across families. So Germanic has an f, where Romance has a p. They're both labial obstruents, but Germanic has switched to a fricative, whereas Romance is still using a plosive. In Germanic, they're using a voiceless version, whereas in Romance, they're using a voiced version. And so there's a lot of related sounds, and we can see the linguistic similarities between them and start being able to piece together what's likely to happen. So that gives you just a basic outline of the ways that we can start looking between languages, comparing these sounds between them to kind of reconstruct what sounds would have looked like previously. We'll practice some of this in class together, but if you have any questions, as always, email me schedule an office hours appointment, and if anything seems unclear or you want to go over it again or you want to discuss any details in more um, detail, then bring those questions to our synchronous class and we can discuss them together.